And tonight it is my pleasure to introduce journalist Jeff Dyer with his new book, The Contest of the Century, The New Era of Competition with China. Uh, Jeff has been writing for the Financial Times since 1994. He is a recipient of a Fulbright Award and of several other journalism awards. He studied at Cambridge and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, he joined the Financial Times as the biotechnology and pharmaceuticals correspondent, Brazil correspondent, and a company's reporter. Uh, he was appointed the Shanghai correspondent in 2005. In, in 2008, he was made Beijing Bureau of Chief. Uh, and he now uses his extensive knowledge and experience in China uh, to examine China's growing uh, global influence and the geopolitical contest between China and the United States that he says will dominate this century. Um, and now I'm going to pass the microphone to our guest. Please welcome Jeff Dyer. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, Politics and Prose. Um, as Anton mentioned, I was a student at uh, Johns Hopkins Science in, in Washington, D.C. for a year, uh, almost a couple of decades ago now. And I lived about three blocks away from here on Fessenden Street. Um, and so I, I used to come here quite often. I remember it being a much smaller place at the time, but I remember it very well. Um, wild away many a Saturday afternoon here when I probably should have been studying for some exam, but I think I, I probably got the better end of the deal in the long run. Um, and also, thanks very much all of you for coming out this evening. I know the, you know, the Olympics are on at the moment. Um, you could all be at home watching the curling final at the moment, but you came out to, to see me. I'm actually from Scotland. That's the one sport we're good at, so I wasn't making a joke about curling there. I, to me, that is a good evening's entertainment, but anyway, I, pr I appreciate it. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I've, I've been at the FT for a couple of decades, which um, even as I say those words is a slightly terrifying thing to say. I never expected to be the one place for such a long time, but I have had a few different lives. I was a correspondent in Brazil for a number of years, and then I was in China for six years, in Shanghai for three, and, and Beijing for three. And now I'm based here writing about American foreign policy. So I'd like to think I've an interesting perspective. I had a chance to see the U.S. through Chinese eyes and a chance to see China through the U.S. eyes. And hopefully that gives me something a little bit interesting to say. And what I'd like to do this evening is talk for a little bit, maybe 20 minutes or so, about my book. And then I'd really like to open it up to questions from all of you. I'd like to, you know, really anything you want to ask me about China or anything else, that, that, that would be fantastic. But before that, I just want to throw out two big propositions for you tonight that are kind of at the core of my book. The first one is that I think we're entering something what I call a new area of geopolitical competition. In the last few years, China has really changed gears in a substantial way. It's shifted from being a country that wanted to keep its head down and grow its economy to a country that now wants to start shaping the world more to its ends. It's behaving very much like a traditional great power. And that means it's going to be butting up against the US in all sorts of important and interesting and surprising ways. So we've been in this area that you might call Davos globalization. We were told that the world is flat. All that is still very much in place, but there's now another force in the opposite direction, something with slightly sharper edges that we're going to be experiencing for the next few decades. And the second big idea, I think, is that even with that, China is going to find it very hard to dislodge the US in any substantial way. The US has big advantages in the, the position it has and the way the world is run. And that's going to be very hard for China to overturn. Um, so I'm, I'm the guy who went to China and came away believing in the U.S. That's not the story you've heard for the last 10 years, but that's kind of where I come out in all this. And if that sounds all a bit sort of, you know, theoretical and weighty, what I've tried to do in the book is to, to find stories and people and places that kind of bring some of these ideas to life to make it, ho hopefully it's not, not too dry and academic. So let's start out with a, the first proposition that China's moved from a rule taker to a rule maker, or it's trying to do that. And um, this really sort of came through to me when I was living in Beijing. I was there during the 2008 Olympics, there during the financial crisis. And there was one particular event that was very sort of, had a very striking impression upon me. That was in October 2009. It was the 60th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And they held this huge parade through the center of Beijing and in Tiananmen Square. It took about three hours, and there were 200,000 people took part in this event. There were civilians and, and, and military people, and it was absolutely immaculate. And of course, that three hours, no one put a single foot wrong. And it really it kind of mixed like North Korean mass choreography with the sort of swagger we used to see from the Soviets on May Day. And it was one of those moments where you really started to feel that the ground was starting to shift a bit, that here was a country 
that was both quite insecure but also very pride very proud about its place in the world and wanted to start having much more influence wanted to start using the power the economic power that's accumulated in the last three decades and to use that to start trying to influence the way the world's run to shape it more to its own designs and we like to talk so much so much about a rising china that's the word that people always use about china it's a rising china and absolutely there's a lot more still to come but in some important ways, China has already risen. It's already reached a stage where it has a critical mass and a size where it can start to influence events or want to start influencing events. Um, there is this very interesting Henry Kissinger qu quote. He was talking actually about the US in the 1890s. And he said, no nation has ever experienced such an increase in its power without seeking to, tr seeking to translate it into global influence. That's the moment that China is at now. It's reached that stage where it has accumulated these resources and this um, and this economic power, and it wants to translate that into influence. But why? So why is this happening now? Well, I think one very important reason was the financial crisis. The financial crisis had a profound psychological impact on China and the way it thinks about itself. There had always been this argument in China about what we're going to do when we become powerful. There were the Chinese hawks who said, we will have to challenge the US in important ways, we'll have to stand up to the US, push back against the US. And the Chinese dove said, no, that's the wrong way to go about it. We need to integrate ourselves into the, the global economy that the U.S. has organized and play by the rules that the U.S. has set. And that's the best way for us to, to benefit our own society. But that was always an argument about the future. What happened with the financial crisis is that came to the forefront. The hawks came out and said, you know what, this is now our time. This is our moment. This is the time when we need to start pushing back. And that doesn't mean to say that they won the argument, but it does mean to say that this is something that's very much going on now, is absolutely present in the way that China thinks about itself and the way that China is behaving. There's just an element of size and scale about this. China has invested, uh, has increased its uh, defense budget by over 10% a year for 20 years now. If you do that for 20 years, you, you eventually end up with a pretty large military. Uh, and China now has a very substantial military and, is, and wants to try and use that to shape events. So to some extent, China is now trying to be more influential simply because it can. And then I think you also have to think about all these interests that China has developed over the last 20 years when its economy has just been exploding at this incredible rate. If you think, if you think about how China keeps its economy going, it now relies on uh, iron ore from Brazil, coal from Indonesia, oil from Sudan, copper from the Congo. All these goods are coming in huge volumes, and need, China needs them to sustain this high rate of economic growth. And so it now has all these interests around the world that it needs to start defending. It can no longer sit back and just, just uh, you know, play a passive role. It needs to start getting more engaged to defend some of those interests. And then finally, I think this is happening now because there have been lots of different pressures from within China that's pushing it in this direction. One of them is a very raucous kind of nationalism that's really uh, developed very strongly in the last decade. A lot of it on the internet, very anti-Japanese, but also strongly skeptical about the US. And that's starting, you've had a whole series of emotional outbursts in China in the last few years that are pushing the country to have a slightly more aggressive, ambitious foreign policy. It was almost the first week or so when we moved to Shanghai uh, in 2005, and we woke up one Saturday morning, and there was this huge demonstration going down the main street in Shanghai, Huaihe Zhonglu. And there were maybe between 10 and 15,000 people taking part in that demonstration, all against the Japanese government. And there were these young, educated kids, high school students, university kids, and they were throwing bottles and, and paint at Japanese shops and Japanese restaurants. And the police were just standing by and watching and laughing. It was a really quite an extraordinary event. It was this real sense of this kind of emotional anger. But also you got the sense that the authorities, for once, were actually very afraid to stand up to this type of protest. Usually when there's political protests in China, it gets clamped down very quickly. But when it's about nationalism, when it's about Japan in particular, the authorities have to stand back a bit. And so there is a sense in the way that China's been conducting itself in the last few years, that sometimes emotion has started to play a much larger role, much less than a, a kind of sense of long-term national interest. And the leadership is maybe not being, it, it's, it, it's, um, Actions are not being completely shaped by this nationalism, but certainly they're afraid to be seen to be backing down in any sense. So they're, they're much more um, boxed in in their positions because of this intense nationalist pressure from below. And then finally, you've had a lot of pressure within the elite as well, the military in China, for instance. There are lots of suggestions that the military have started to get much more ambitious and much more assertive in trying to push forward their agenda. 
uh, it's probably the hardest thing for people who study China to actually understand is the relationship between the Communist Party and the military. It's a real black box. It's very opaque. But every now and again, in the last few years, you've been getting these little signals, these little indications that the military, which is itself very skeptical about the United States, is starting to push back a bit. It's starting to push for a more ambitious, aggressive agenda. And the result of all this is I think you're starting to see much more competition with the US. The world since the end of the Second World War has been run by institutions that the US created, by US values, by US money, and in all sorts of ways that China is now starting to push back against that. It's starting to say, this is our time now. We need to start having an influence on the way these rules are dictated, the way these rules are, are written. We want to have our say. And there are three particular ways I would, I would draw your attention to. The first, I think, is a, in, the, in the military area. Uh, you're seeing uh, a very rapidly growing competition in the Western Pacific between the Chinese Navy and the US Navy to be, if you like, the sort of top dog in, in that region. Um, in that military buildup I was describing in China, the Navy has, has been given sort of pride of place for the last two decades. China's invested very extensively in building up uh, it's warships, submarines, it has a new aircraft carrier, and building up a whole series of missiles, some based on land, some at sea, that are directed precisely at American ships that have been patrolling and monitoring the Western Pacific for the last few decades. And it's a very careful, deliberate strategy. It's not about starting a war, it's just about creating uncertainty in the minds of American commanders and slowly and surely pushing the US further back out to sea. At the same time, China has been very deliberately Taking, trying to take control of little bits of land. There are a whole series of contested islands and bits of land in the Western Pacific, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea. These rather obscure disputes that you probably heard about on the news that seem rather unconnected and rather strange because no one lives on these, these islands. But they're all part of this very deliberate strategy of China to take control of, the, of these seas, of these, these bits of land, and again, to, 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 and again slowly and surely push the US out. In the process, it hopes to undermine the US alliances with Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines. And that would leave it in a much stronger position to influence the way that commerce and economics and even politics are conducted in Asia. So it's a very important dynamic that's going on. It's a bit glacial. It doesn't always translate into you know, front page news stories, but it's a very, very important thing that's going on. And it's going to be very prominent in the next couple of decades. The uh, second thing that China is doing is investing very heavily in soft power. It's really very engaged in the idea of soft power. The idea of soft power is that a country is influential not just by its military or by its checkbook, but by its ability to be attractive to other countries. And China has been investing hugely in Confucius Institutes that send around the world that teach the Chinese language. And it's invested a lot of money in Chinese media companies. It's, it's got a, now got a cable news channel in the US. It's investing in radio in the US. It has an English language newspaper that's spreading quite aggressively around the world. It's a very ambitious strategy. Just to give you an example of just how ambitious this is, if you go now to Times Square in New York City, and there's that, that one building in Times Square, 47th and Broadway, it's the most famous sort of neon advertising slots in the whole of the United States. There's a million tourists pass there every couple of days. There are now three main brands there. Coca-Cola, the most famous brand in the world. Samsung, the biggest mobile phone company in the world. And the Xinhua News Agency, the Communist Party's main news agency. Now, having a, an advertisement in New York doesn't mean a great deal in itself, but it does show you the very big ambitions there that China has to try and take these organizations overseas. And then finally, China is trying to, the final thing I draw your attention to is the way that China is trying to take its currency and transform it into an international reserve currency that will challenge the US dollar in important ways. That would have big economic advantages for China, for its companies, but there's also a political agenda there, there as well. China thinks that the US has, gets too much of an advantage because of the role the dollar plays, because of the exorbitant privilege, as people describe it, that the dollar enjoys. And it wants to slowly chip away at some of that power that the US has on the back of the, the role that the US dollar has. But I think it's important to, when I stress these things about competition, it's important to say this is not a story about you know red China, or communist China trying to export revolution or dominate the world. This is not a return to a new Cold War. This is actually a return to an older type of competition. This is how big, important countries behave in history. They, they nudge up against each other, they jostle, they push, they prod for influence and power and to be able to try and shape the world more to the, their ends. This is, the, this is an absolutely sort of discernible pattern you've seen from history. It goes back 
not to the, the last century of the Cold War, but it goes back to previous eras, the 19th century, for instance, we have these great powers that push up against each other. And that's why I call it a contest. This is not an all-out struggle. Uh, the, US, the US won the Cold War by, by essentially toppling the Soviet economy. That's not the result here. That's not the, the, the game here. This is more of a chessboard than a struggle. So that's the first part. Um, but the second part of my argument is actually, even though China has these ambitions and is starting to put into place some of these plans, it's really going to have a very hard time in pushing back against the US. Uh, and I'll just say a few words about Asia um, and this whole military competition in Asia and so why that's going to be very hard, because I think that's, that's the real kind of crux and the real issue that's getting a lot of attention in Washington and getting a lot of attention around the region. And I think there are two main points as to why it's going to be hard. The first is that when you look at Asia today, it's not just about China that's rising. Actually, there are a whole series of different countries that are rising. China's not rising in its isolation. South Korea is an incredibly successful country. Vietnam's doing very well. Indonesia is coming into its own. And then you have India, the other one billion country in Asia that also thinks that this is its century. And even Japan, after two decades of stagnation, Japan is also potentially beginning to turn the corner as well. So China's rising into this area where it's surrounded by all these dynamic, confident countries that also think this is their time too. And so they don't want to be dominated by, by a rising China. I think the second reason is that China, as it's adopted this more ambitious strategy in the last few years, has managed to generate a huge amount of opposition to itself within the region. In Washington, we always, people talk always about the Obama administration's pivot to Asia. Everything's thought about in terms of how US policy is directed at the region. But the really important thing that's happened in the last few years is the backlash against China that it's managed to generate amongst all sorts of different countries. And really, if you go around the region, you can see that very decisively. You see that in South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, even a country like Vietnam, where the US was at war with Vietnam three and a half decades ago. Now the US Navy and the Vietnamese Navy are cooperating together in all sorts of ways to slowly and subtly push back against China. And just to give you one little example of some of the way that the politics have changed in, in this. A decade ago in South Korea, um, you'd be familiar with the, the South Korean rapper Psy, the Gangnam Style guy, the guy who had the, the world's biggest YouTube hit two years ago. Well, 10 years ago, he was the guy who actually crystallized a deep kind of resentment about the US that was developing in all sorts of countries across the region. Um, he, had a, uh, he had one concert in, I think it was 2002, 2003, where he put a US tank on stage, and he smashed up this tank on stage. And he had these lyrics about, uh, in one of his songs that went, kill those Yankees who've been torturing Iraqi captives. Kill those Yankees who ordered them to torture. And there's a real sense in a country like South Korea that its traditional alliance with the U.S. has started to fray. There's a younger generation who are very skeptical about the U.S. and that China was starting to make big inroads. Fast forward a decade, and a country like South Korea has become much more alarmed about what a powerful China will mean and now has a much stronger alliance with the U.S. And because China's support for North Korea, it's really created lots of suspicions in South Korea about what its ultimate objectives and its ultimate agenda are. And that's a pattern you can see in Japan and the Philippines, Australia, all across the region, that a decade ago, it did seem as if China was making inroads in politics in these countries. But fast forward a decade, and actually China has lost a lot of ground. And all these countries are actually urging the US to be much more involved in the region. They're almost clamoring for the US to get involved. This is not a story about the US trying to push itself in a region. It's a story about a region urging the US to come in and be involved and to give it some sort of backup and security against what they fear might be a, a sort of slightly intimidating, bullying China. Um, so I'm going to finish finally though with a, just a couple of comments on um, the problems the US is going to face, because I don't want to make it seem as if this is going to be very easy. Actually, this is going to be an incredibly difficult challenge for the US, and there are several things that the US is going to have to do if it really is going to deal with the way that China is starting to behave. One thing is it's going to have, need to have much, much more focus in the way it thinks about the world. You know, we, we live in Washington. You can go to a speech in Washington every day of the week where pretty much every nook and cranny of the world is described as a vital American national security interest. Um, basically, the whole world is, is, is dangerous and threatening, and the U.S. needs to be involved. The U.S. had that luxury um, at the end of the Cold War when the Cold War ended, and the war on terror has very much encouraged that kind of attitude. But now that it's facing a real sort of genuine challenge in Asia, the US is going to have to be much more focused about where are the areas it's interested in and where are the areas that it doesn't necessarily need to be too worried about. Um, 
And the administration's had a real problem with this. I mean, you, you, it announced this big in initiative towards Asia in 2012. It said, you know, this is called the pivot. We're very much here to stay. You know, we're back in Asia, Hillary Clinton said. And that came on very strong in 2012. And then 2013, already the U.S. has got distracted. You know, the Middle East just dominates so much of attention. John Kerry is just so, you know, purely focused on Syria and Iran and the Israel-Palestinian peace process. And already the Chinese are going around the region saying, look, you, know, you can't rely on the Americans. They've, 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 they've kind of lost interest already. They've, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've been given up, but they've got distracted. They've moved on to the next thing. You can't really rely on them. You need to deal with us. So that's going to be very hard for the U.S. And a sort of corollary of that is a lot of this is going to be very, need very kind of disciplined, focused diplomacy from the U.S. One thing that Hillary Clinton was brilliant at in Asia was that she went everywhere. Every diplomatic meeting there was, no matter how dull or tedious the agenda was, Hillary Clinton was there. And that's a very important psychological effect. It gives a sense that the U.S. is engaged, that it sees its future as very much tied to the region. Again, the, the U.S. has slightly lost that in the last year. Uh, the president was supposed to go to Asia last year, but he had to cancel his trip because of the budget crisis, the, bu the, the government shutdown and the debt ceiling crisis. Again, that sends a signal that the U.S. has really kind of lost attention, that it's moved, moved on. It's going to require very disciplined, patient, uh, diplomatic attention to get this right. And the final thing, it was almost the hardest thing, is the U.S. is going to have to have a much better economic story to tell to itself and to tell to the region about its future. Um, in this country, everyone agrees that uh, in order to really revive the economy, not this kind of re recovery we've had since the crisis where you know, the 1% does well, but a real sustained recovery, that's going to require exports, it's going to require improving manufacturing. Asia has to be a big part of that. That's where the big markets are, that's where the potential new customers are. If the U.S. is really going to revive its economy in a sustainable way, it's going to have to be much more closely integrated with Asia. But that's a desperately hard story to tell in the U.S. at the moment because there's so much skepticism about globalization. People think that trade deals have uh, you know, been bad news for the U.S. People think that the U.S. has been cheated by globalization. And so that's a very hard political sell. And already the administration is having a lot of problems with this new trade deal it has for Asia. But ultimately, that's going to be the key <clears throat> because if the U.S. wants to be relevant in Asia, it can't just be about having a couple of aircraft carriers that come in when things get tricky. It has to be about its economic future being closely tied to the future of Asia and vice versa. So I'm going to leave you with that. That's just a few kind of general thoughts. And I'd really love to hear some of your questions, some of your thoughts. Uh, if people disagree, agree, want to talk about anything they want to ask, please fire ahead with your questions. Sir. And if, I, if you could come to the microphones, that would be great. You mention in your book <coughs> that um, Chinese government spends more on internal security than on the defense budget. Probably um, in light of the fact that on average there are 500 political demonstrations a day in China, <coughs> over 180,000 a year. We did not foresee the fall of the Soviet Union. We did not foresee the Arab Spring. What are the chances that the Chinese government uh, could find itself being attacked by its own people if they cannot keep up the economic growth that they have gotten used to over the last 25 years? Um, I think the first thing to say about that is that you know, China is absolutely not Egypt. Or so, yeah, Egypt was a situation where you had a, a regime that had been stagnating for 20 years. You had, you know, a whole generation of people coming onto the labor market who just felt they had no opportunities. China has had has built up you know, its economy over 20 years. It's, it's improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people. That has built up a substantial reserve of legitimacy for the Communist Party. <clears throat> so, so it's in a much stronger position than almost any authoritarian regime around the world. It has, you know, much broader acceptance than most other countries. However, China does have you know, a very large and growing dynamic middle class. And you know, as we've seen over the last 50 years, there isn't a single example of a very sort of dynamic middle class country that hasn't adopted some form of political liberalization. And maybe Hong Kong is a bit of an exception. But by and large, the general rule has been that you know, those kinds of pressures, when you get educated middle class people, they want to be more involved in the political system. And my basic assumption is China will, will face those pressures as well at some stage. 
It might take a lot longer than some other countries because the party does have much more um, acceptance, but eventually those pressures will take hold. And I think if you talk to young Chinese people these days, they don't necessarily want democracy or elections, but they absolutely expect to have much less censorship of the media. They absolutely expect to have a legal system that's less dominated by the Communist Party. And they absolutely ex expect to have a much more active civil society where they can organize themselves and clubs and social groups and organizations and the kind of things that the Communist Party has been very allergic to because it sees them as you know, the, the bedrock of a, a political opposition. So I think over the next decade, it's not something that's going to happen this year or next year, but if the party doesn't find ways to respond to this new middle class, to find ways to include them in some way in the governing of the country, then it's going to have a real problem. But it's not something that's necessarily going to happen tomorrow. Um, so I haven't read the book yet, although it sounds very interesting. <laughs> but you. I'm intrigued by the last thing you said uh, in connection with the <coughs> Trans-Pacific Partnership that sure. we're going to need to engage. And I hope you didn't mean that we were going to accept the Chinese situation the way it is, where they still have, they still pay their workers very little. It's a lot more than they were making doing subsistence farming in the West. Um, but it, by our standards, it's not very much, and, and there's no question that it's driven wages down in this country. And the beneficiaries have been not China particularly, but large multinational corporations. And what I've heard about the TPP from sources that I trust, even though it's been, uh, the negotiations have been conducted behind some closed doors, is this is going to be another gift to uh, large multinational corporations. They're going to be able to take countries uh, into arbitration uh, over laws that they've, countries have passed, uh, regulating environmental uh, situations, regulating labor conditions, um, and, it's, and, and it's going to override their sovereignty. That this is not about improving the situation of uh, our workers or even Chinese workers. It's all about increasing international profits that we have that we can't even tax because they're outside the country. So I wondered what what you meant when you said that we China's going to no question be part of, of an important player in how our economy works. And I was wondering what you were sort of how you how you were picturing that. Okay, so just a for people who don't know TPP is a, a trade negotiation that's going at the moment of 12 countries uh, some of them in the Americas, some of them in Asia. It's a kind of keystone of the administration's economic agenda for Asia. Right. Um, several things I said to that. First thing is that China is, is not part of TPP. Um, and more broadly, you know, plenty of people have argued that some of the trade deals the U.S. has done in recent years have been a kind of race to the bottom where they've ended up lowering standards. Right. This is much less of a risk with this trade deal because most of the other countries are actually quite developed countries. And some of them even have higher standards than, than the U.S. In, in some of these areas in labor standards and environment, uh, but Japan, for instance. Secondly, there's a real big opportunity here for the U.S., one of which is, is actually Japan. The U.S. has been banging on the door in Japan for 25 years to try and get more into its markets. Um, it was a huge political issue in the 90s. As Japan has stagnated, that's become slightly less of a priority. But here, all of a sudden, the U.S. has this opportunity to get much more into the Japanese market because the Japan, for various reasons, feels it wants to be part of this organization as a way of hedging against China. And so actually, for once, the, the geopolitics of this are actually working very much in America's favor. Uh, it has a real opportunity to get inroads into Japan that it's wanted for, for 20 years. Um, but then the final point is that you're absolutely right. There, you know, the, the devil is always in the details in a trade deal. We actually don't know what's going on because it is all held in secret. And there's, there's no real way around that because you have this negotiation where you have 12 different countries and it's all about, you know, it's a sort of complex, multifaceted game of chess where you're making a trade off here to Japan and then they make something to Vietnam, who make something to Australia. And so it ha just by the nature of the negotiation, it has to be kept pretty secret because there are all these different kind of pressures. But the result is that you're right, we will not know the actual impact until the deal is done. And so there is a real sort of democratic issue with the way that trade negotiations are done that, that is actually undermining legitimacy and is one of the reasons why it's very unpopular in this country. That's I right. don't really see a way how you can negotiate that kind of deal without having that, just because it is so complicated. Uh, well, without more information, they're not going to get fast track, not through Congress. Absolutely. You're absolutely right on that. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi. Um, I could imagine about 14 questions to ask right now, but I'll narrow it to one that is constantly in the news and fascinates for all the wrong grotesque reasons, which is how do we see North Korea through our eyes. How is it that they see as an emerging classic superpower their, if you will, responsibility for that situation on their doorstep? I mean, we have a sense of responsibility based on our relationship with South Korea and the history of the war there, but how do they see that? How does the how does the government see it versus does is there a nationalistic sense of pride in protecting the longtime partner among the people too or or do they just go we don't get it either i mean um so the, the kind of big answer is that ultimately china sees north korea as a kind of buffer uh it doesn't want a unification of the two koreas that would push potentially push the U.S. Army up to its border. They have a U.S.-friendly ally right on its border. Um, but also, you know, there's lots of scary things. If the regime was to implode, then, you know, maybe the U.S. military would feel the need to intervene in some way, and you'd have the Chinese military intervening, and that'd be a very scary situation. So their basic bottom line is that they don't want, they want to keep the regime alive because they don't, they, they see it as a kind of a very necessary strategic buffer. However, they are deeply, deeply concerned at this precise moment. I mean, they they sort of um, underpinned the transition to Kim Jong Un. I mean, they were the kind of you know the handmaids and handmaids of that transition. But they thought their their sort of trump card was they had very good relations with his uncle, Jiang Song Sek, right? Uh, and he's the guy who Kim Jong Un had executed a couple of months ago. So the Chinese are suddenly suddenly have seen their their guy, if you like, and their leverage and their access and the regime taken away from them. So they're terrified. Uh, but even then, even with all that, when it comes down to it, they still see there's a really big risk is that North Korea would implode. Because they still see the strategic, it's vi very important for them not to have the state and not to have this kind of you know, another US friendly country right on their borders. And that ultimately is going to be their bottom line. But they are putting pressure on the North Koreans. They've cut some of the oil imports. They are, they're trying to squeeze Kim Jong-un and st to stop him from doing crazy stuff. But they have lost a lot of the potential influence that they had, absolutely. And they are very worried. Um, so I, I don't want to sugarcoat it for you at all. Yeah, it's just so strangely, grotesquely fascinating. But again, this is another example of just the way that they've managed to undermine their position in, in the region because they are the people who are supporting and, and underpinning this crazy young guy who's going around executing his uncle. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's an extraordinary situation. You know, you can't make it up, right? Yeah. Sir. Um, I was wondering, if, given the very strong motives toward an ambitious overall thrust by China that you describe, are, how convinced are you that the actual program isn't going to be more provocative than you present. I mean, it seems you start from uh, these motives of national pride, popular nationalism, uh, concern with protection of the uh, import uh, routes, uh, and the bureaucratic interest of the military. All of that might point toward a much more aggressive policy, I would think, than you, you seem to predict. I mean, the, the, the idea of gradually improving their uh, power and influence over other countries, uh, that that seems fairly restrained and, and you don't attribute any territorial ambitions or or more, you know, I mean, if, if you have a very nationalistic population, it doesn't seem it, like it would be that satisfying to pursue such a slow, uh, gradual plan. So I think the way to think about that is that, uh, you know, I've described, if you like, this one side of the Chinese psyche and the Chinese thinking. But the whole other side is that you know, China has benefited hugely from the economic system that U.S. has set up over the last 20 years. In fact, China has been probably the biggest beneficiary. And these forces of economic, <clears throat> this economic links and globalization are a big restraining factor on the Chinese. Uh, and the second point is that they, they don't want to achieve these goals by an open conflict. That would be very very damaging for them. It would you know, be very economically damaging. They might also lose one of those battles. If they were to actually pick a, a real military fight with the Japanese at the moment, they might actually lose it, which would be the single most dangerous thing for the Communist Party. 
in terms of their own legitimacy and hold on power. But so the strategy is, is much more about just trying to win slow incremental gains without actually doing anything that starts an overt conflict. Now, it's very risky because you have the situation in the <coughs> Senkaku Diaoyu Islands at the moment where there are Chinese planes and Japanese planes that are kind of buzzing around and you could have an accident that would set off the, the, one of these you know, com conflicts that they're trying to avoid. But I don't think there's going to be an actual invasion of the islands. I think that they realize that would be a very self-defeating, too provocative step. They have a, a longer-term strategy of just slowly and surely increasing their influence. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Hi. Um, everyone's here to hear about what you have to say about China, but could you just talk briefly about what it's like reporting? Um, I assume that when you got there, at least, you didn't speak or read Chinese fluently. I mean, how do you, where do you start? How did you get your sources? And can you just talk a little bit about the challenges of being a journalist there? Sure, absolutely. Um, that's a really interesting question. So there are kind of two, if you, if you take the foreign journalists in China, there are sort of two different schools of people. There's a whole bunch of people who have been there since the, some of them since the 70s, but a lot of them since the 80s. And to them, China is just an absolutely transformed country, completely different. They would describe, to be a journalist in China in the 70s or 80s, they would basically get the People's Daily every day. That would be their one source of information. And they'd go through these articles, and they'd just be sort of turgid propaganda. And they would look for the word dan shi, which means but. And they would see that but, and then they'd know that that was actually someone trying to say something, trying to send a political message. And basically, they would construct their whole story from the two paragraphs after the word but. That was the way you did journalism. So to them now, I mean, China is just a completely different country, absolutely different, much more open, much more accessible. There are people in the government you can talk to. There are people... You know, you know, you could tr travel around most of the country relatively freely. So, so to them, China is now just a brilliant place to be a journalist. If you've been a reporter in lots of other countries and then go to China, you do find it's still a very difficult place. You can talk to people in the government, but there's there are whole branches of it that, that don't really talk to foreign reporters. There's a lot of pressure, so sort of subtle pressure put on you by the government. But more importantly, they put pressure on your contacts. Um, there are lots, there are maybe 20 or 30 people are in jail at the moment for having said things to, to foreign journalists that they probably shouldn't and got themselves into a lot of trouble. And so there's no actual censorship of what we write, but there's, there is a degree of self-censorship because you're constantly worrying about, you know, are you going to expose this person to risks? You know, Because you know, you can sense when you write a story whether that's going to get them into trouble or not. And there are some people who know exactly the risks and they're you know, quite happy to take them. And the reason they've come to you is because they've tried everything else in the system and you're their kind of last resort as a foreign journalist, and they're, they're quite happy to take that risk. But there are other people who don't quite understand it, and so you have to be very careful you know, how you deal with that. The final thing I'd say, though, is in the last two or three years, probably actually the last five years, it's actually become much harder. The government has really taken a much harder line on the foreign media. It started, I think, in 2008, when they had the Tibet riots, uh, and there was a lot of criticism of China. And one of the ways that the government turned the situation domestically they focused on the foreign media and basically went to war against the foreign media and blamed the foreign media for, for bias, distorted reporting. And they, they, they picked up a few examples of people had absolutely got things wrong and turned it into this kind of almost a propaganda campaign against the foreign media. And that played very well in domestic politics. I think they kind of realized that that was a sort of winning strategy. And then more recently, in the last year or so, um, you've had a uh, you've had a couple of very important stories, one by the New York Times about uh, former Premier Wen Jiabao and his family wealth, another one by Bloomberg about uh, President Xi Jinping and his family's wealth, exposing the fact that their broader families have, are now worth kind of several billion dollars. I mean, these are not people who are worth, you know, to them, Mitt Romney has just got chump change. I mean, this is like serious money that they've managed to generate. And the party hated those stories, absolutely hated those stories. And so they have very, in a kind of focused, deliberate way, trying to intimidate news organizations against writing that kind of story. And so they've almost shut down Bloomberg's business in China. Uh, and they have, there are three New York Times journalists who haven't had their visas approved, and they, they almost chucked out the whole lot. So it's so a kind of long, complicated answer where things were really difficult in the 70s, got a lot better, but actually in the last few years, things have got a bit tougher. Hi. Um I'm trying to really figure out what is China, you know, in order to figure out where it's headed. And you're talking about this huge military that they built up. And, you know, what the, why are they building up this military if they're not going to use it? What, what are they doing with the military? They're also out there buying land all over the world. And I guess a lot of that is for the natural resources. Um, 
what's aren't they going to be tempted to start using their military at some point to, to take control when they need more of these resources? And then also, and maybe this is a separate question, but it's sort of related, how do, how do the people, how do they connect to the government? What, what, do they have any say about what's being done or is it the, the handful of people that um, are really in control um, that, or, or maybe it is in a handful. I, I don't really understand it well enough to, who's really making those decisions and is that going to be changing in the future? So that's sort of a very vague question. Sure, no, fantastic questions. Um, I think the first thing to say about the military is we shouldn't be remotely surprised about this. This is what you know, important countries, many important countries have always done in history. This is what the US did, if you like, at a similar phase in its history when it started to become globally relevant, globally important. It also built up a huge navy from the 1890s and started to use that navy to try and control sea routes, to try and shape events more to its 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 its, its interests. So we shouldn't, there's nothing that China's doing that is actually remotely surprising or that you know, breaks historic rules. It's a very natural thing for it to be doing. But your second point, I think, was was very interesting. I mean, I to answer the previous question, I tried to describe what is a, a kind of patient, disciplined, long-term strategy. But the risk that when you have all these military assets is that precisely that you get people, kind of hawkish people in the military, which every society has and China has in a quite large number, who do, who, do, who do start to think, we've got this military, why don't we use it? You know, it does start to change. Power changes people, but it changes countries as well. And so the risk is that actually it starts to become a temptation that people are sort of lured by the idea of a quick win for some of these territorial disputes in Asia. That's absolutely something that could happen in the next few decades. It's not, you know, it's not inevitable, but it's very much something we have to watch out for and, and be aware of there is a potential risk. Um, second question about, you know, if you like, the broader politics and the, the role of the, the population. I think the, the, the distinction to make is that a country like North Korea is a totalitarian country where the government just controls everything. China is not that country anymore by a long way. China's an authoritarian country where the government censors and represses dissent but it can't just make up a reality. It has to respond in important ways to public opinion. Um, and that's where I think the nationalism becomes very important, because that's one of the areas where the government is the most sensitive about. The way to lose your job in the Chinese system is to be seen to be weak about Japan or about the US and be criticized for being weak. Now to, from the, the, the party is most vulnerable from the nationalist right to political criticism. It's closed off a lot of the criticism from, like, if you like, from some of the more social issues or political issues. But from the nationalist right, it's very vulnerable because it presents itself as the, the, the organization that saved China from colonialism, that you know, China stood up again, as Mao Zedong said. And so a, a party that presents itself as that kind of national savior is very vulnerable to the idea that it's being soft to foreigners. Thank you. Sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, I just got a, really a, a question about timing of this book. Um, quite apart from dynamics, you've got a contract and congratulations, you've got it published and all of that, but there's been a change of leadership sure. in China and I, I've yet to read the book, um, but from what you've been saying, I get the sense that you feel there is something uh, that goes beyond the personalities of leaders in the dynamic and the future of China. And yet everything we read about this new leader and some of his actions suggests he's quite different from his predecessors, and that we expect, although we don't know what it's going to be, changes in leadership and in the way in which he leads both the military and the party, as, as well as aspects of China. So are you sort of saying it really doesn't matter that you've got this new leader, that there's a, a momentum there behind the thrust of the proposition that you make that basically is is greater than any individual or any new party leadership in China? That's another fantastic question. Um, in some ways, writing this book is a terrifying experience for me because I'm a, I'm a newspaper journalist. I mean, journalism is already quite quick, but I'm a newspaper journalist, right? So I'm basically used to, if I write a story on Monday, it's fish and ship paper on Wednesday. Um, but with this, I brought this manuscript in a you know, it's almost a year old already as it's coming out. So that's quite a scary proposition for me. And as you mentioned, Xi Jinping was really only in power for two or three months by the time I had to, had to hand in my book. So that potentially is a, is a bit interesting and dangerous dynamic. But I don't think he necessarily completely changes the story um, in any substantial way. 
Uh, the way I describe him is he's a authoritarian reformist nationalist. Those are the the the, the way I would frame uh, his agenda. Um, and so you know, he's very much focused on quite ambitious domestic economic reforms at the moment. Uh, and that's going to be the thing he's going to place most of his attention on. And so one of the risks with that is that you know, to do that, he's going to have to take on a lot of a very powerful vested interests within the party. And so one way to do that, one way to gain the political capital to do that, is to maybe the temptation is to actually be very tough on the foreigners, particularly with Japan. It's entirely possible that one of the reasons he's actually accelerated the sort of Chinese pressure over the Senkaku Diayu Islands is precisely that, that he's trying to win political cards, political capital, so that he can push through some of his economic reforms. But I do think that his personality is, is very, very important. He's a, uh, unlike his predecessor, Hu Jintao, who had, a, had very weak relations with the military and was very criticized by the military, Xi Jinping is steeped in the military. His father was a revolutionary hero. His entire career has been quite c closely connected to the military. His first job was as a, a sort of personal assistant to the Minister of Defense, and he wore a military uniform to the office every day. He was very proud about that. And even when he was a provincial official, he always kept very close to the military people in his region. And the military are a big part of his personal political support base within the system. So the, one of the crucial questions for China in the next decade is his actual attitude towards the military. Is he the guy who can control the military, who can slightly damp down some of these pressures I was describing, slightly put the military more in the box? Or is he actually someone who's going to channel the military? Does he actually share many of their instincts and their sort of skepticism about the US? And that's one of the great sort of unanswered questions as, as over the next decade that's going to be very interesting to watch. Sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, China's interest in expanding its influence globally in economic terms. Uh, and you, you mentioned specifically uh, its interest in uh, maybe gradually having its own currency displace the U.S. dollar as a global currency of uh, reference. Uh, what does this imply for the kinds of changes China must make both economically and in terms of rule of law, the kind of liquidity it's got to offer to other people around the world, and what are the prospects for doing that in any foreseeable time frame? That's a really interesting question. My, my basic argument is that although they are quite ambitious about what they want to do with their currency, they're going to have a very hard time, basically because of the things you, you just described. Um, the, uh, the reason why, the, the way the Chinese economic system works, people think about a state capitalism as the phrase people use, and the, people think about state-owned companies. But actually, the real key is the financial system and the way that the government absolutely controls the financial system. So the government decides basically how much money is being lent every year. So when you had the financial crisis here, what that actually meant was that banks lost trust with each other and stopped lending to each other, and economic activity plummeted. In China, the Communist Party said, we're facing a crisis, go and lend, and bank lending doubled. So that was a very effective tool that they had. But the way that they, they, they are able to control the financial system is having a very high wall of controls around it. It's very hard to take money in, into China and take money out of China. So they protect the financial system. And you cannot have an international currency if you have those kinds of controls. Uh, you, you simply cannot have, people will not, cannot invest in the currency. They cannot hold bonds in your bonds or buy your bonds or buy other renminbi based assets unless you start to tear down some of these financial controls. So the party really faces a, a choice. It can have its own brand of state capitalism or it can potentially have an international currency, but it can't really have both. Uh, and given that they're the party's sort of political control over the country is quite strongly linked to this financial control, my bet is they'll be very slow in dismantling any of those controls. Mm. Okay. Great. Well, listen, I think we're running out of time. So listen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming out this evening. I really enjoyed talking to you.